Good evening, and welcome to the September 21st, 2022 meeting of the Montgomery County Historic Preservation Commission. My name is Bob Sutton, and I'm the chair, and I would like for commission members to introduce themselves starting on my left. Sarah Nasser. Christina Arado. Jeffrey Haynes. Karen Burdett. Marsha Barnes. James Doman. Julie Pelletier. And staff. <laughs> Dan Brukert, Historic Preservation Staff. Rebecca Ballow, Historic Preservation Staff. Michael Kine, Historic Preservation Staff. <laughs> John Lieberts, Historic Preservation Staff. Thank you. The first item on our agenda tonight is a work session for the public and public hearing on locational atlas designation for the Weller Dry Cleaning um, Store at 8237 Fenton Street, Silver Spring, Maryland. Is there a staff report? Yes, uh, good evening again. Uh, John Lieberts, Cult Cultural Resource Planner with Montgomery Planning. So the purpose of tonight's public hearing and work session is to determine whether the Weller's Dry Cleaning Site at 8237 Fenton Avenue in downtown Silver Spring meets designation criteria for listing in the Locational Atlas and Index of Historic Sites. Overall, staff found that the site meets the designation criteria as outlined in Section 24A3 of the County Code and requests that the HPC recommends that the Planning Board list Wellers to the Locational Atlas. The Locational Atlas, under the purview of the Planning Board, is a listing of resources that are potentially historic. The designation protects these resources from substantial alteration until they can be fully evaluated for the master plan for historic preservation. Similar to the master plan, resources on the atlas must potentially satisfy historical and cultural significance or architectural and design significance. If the building is listed to the atlas, staff will return to the HPC for a later public hearing and work session for its designation to the master plan for historic preservation. The County Council recently adopted the Silver Spring Downtown Adjacent Communities Plan, which recommended studying wellers and encouraged the adaptive reuse of the building if the occupant and use changed. The approval of the plan, paired with the recent closure of the business, spurred the start of this process. The environmental setting for the proposed historic site includes the entire parcel associated with the business and the signage located in the current sidewalk and right of way. Here are some quick highlights of the Weller's dry cleaning site before we explore the historic context in greater detail. Architect Ted Engelhart designed the uh, Googie style, designed the building in the Googie style, which is a subset of the modern movement for the Weller brothers. The dry cleaner opened in 1961 and is a significant example of roadside commercial architecture in Montgomery County. So first, I wanted to share some brief context regarding the dry cleaning in industry and Googie architecture. The Weller brothers entered the dry cleaning business at, at an exciting time as the industry evolved due to new technologies, mechanization, and expanded business models. The relegation of these business businesses to industrial and manufacturing areas of the cities ended as companies directly engaged consumers. In particular, drive-in and drive-through dry cleaners expanded after World War II. These businesses were located on well-traveled roads that facilitated the pickup and drop-off of clothing. These advancements in the spread of suburban cleaners, focusing on capturing the attention of motorists, led to changes in the design of stores. Manuals published regarding the design of modern dry cleaning plants highlighted the advantages of the modern movement of architecture to create forward-looking, streamlined designs with wide canopies that would engage the public. Architects recognized that the new stores would serve as the pr primary advertisement for the business, so employed bright, brilliant colors and floor-to-ceiling plate glass windows to invite customers to view the modern equipment and cleaning process. Furthermore, the industry recognized the importance of large, bold signage during the day and illuminated signs for the evening hours. The burgeoning Googie architecture coalesced with these design goals. So on the slide here, the photographs on the right column are from a 1945 manual on the design of, uh, of cleaning stores. The bottom left image is an example of a one-hour modernizing store. And the middle image is actually a drawing of a Benjamin Weller-owned store in North Carolina. 
While that building had fewer modern influence components than the Silver Spring store, you can see the importance of the signage with the design of the stone veneered fin on the front of the building. So Googie architecture started in California and spread across America in the 1940s and 1950s. The style captured the burgeoning aesthetic for roadside architecture, which the public embraced with coffee houses, diners, drive-ins, motels, bowling alleys, arcades, and dry cleaners. Architects of the style capitalized on the national obsession with atomic energy, space travel, and new building technologies. These buildings had bold and dynamic features that created strong curb appeal for motorists and the surrounding community. And here we have two examples of Googie style buildings uh, from Los Angeles. The character defining elements of the Googie style include dramatic angles and shapes, upswept cantilevered roofs, and floor to ceiling window windows, all juxtaposed with natural materials such as stone veneers. Bright colors that accentuated the form and bold commercial signage attracted customers with its physical presence in the landscape. Uh, here is another example of a Googie style building, the prestige exceptional Fabricare that's located on Georgia Avenue in Montgomery Hills. Now I'll shift to the history of Weller's Dry Cleaning, its original owners and architects. Benjamin Weller started his career in the dry cleaning industry in the 1940s. He opened a one hour modernizing dry cleaning franchise store in Silver Spring in 1950, and then a second store in Rockville in 1953. Around that time, World War II veteran Charles Weller, his brother, moved from Pennsylvania to join the company where he served as a secretary or manager of the business. Shown here are two photographs of the earlier locations of the Weller's uh, first dry cleaning stores in Montgomery County. Charles and Benjamin Weller purchased the property at 8237 Fenton Street in 1960. As you can see on the signs advertising in this construction photograph, it started as a one-hour modernizing franchise who had the slogan shown here, the most in dry cleaning. One-hour modernizing and similar franchises had shifted to non-flammable synthetic solvents that allowed for quicker on-site service in the late 1940s. The company offered small businesses the advantages of training, equipment, selection, layout, market research, advertising, and accounting while retaining their traditional independence. The Weller, brother, the Weller brothers hired architect Ted Engelhardt to design the store. Julian Theodore Engelhardt, better known as Ted Engelhardt, started his career in Tennessee before moving to the, to the Washington, D.C. region in 1934. Engelhardt was one of the early founders of the Potomac Valley chapter of the AIA and first served as treasurer before his election as the third president of the chapter. Locally, he designed numerous buildings at the University of Maryland. Uh, he, in Silver Spring, he designed the Operations Research Institute and other churches, schools, and shopping centers throughout the county. The subject store opened in 1961. Benjamin Weller, who had less direct involvement with the business, divested his financial interest, interest at the subject property in 1978. Charles Weller opened and operated the dry cleaners for over 55 years until he died at his home in Silver Spring in 2016. So now I'll shift to, design, to the, de, the design of the building. Architect Ted Engelher relied on the elements of the Googie style to create a landmark building in downtown Silver Spring. He successfully contrasted the solid red and pink striped porcelain enamel box to a stone veneered and lighter projecting section featuring expansive windows and a cantilevered awning that floated in the air. The roof form permitted greater visibility with its floor to ceiling windows. In addition, the business featured an original distinctive Googie styled sign that oriented travelers on Fenton Street and harmonized with the design of the building. All these features combined to create a playful and quirky landmark that engaged the everyday consumer with a modern and popular architecture in lieu of the high style austerity of the international brutalist and expressionist styles. Uh, here are the side elevations of the building. Uh, you can see the contrast between the porcelain enamel and the stone veneer that anchors the corner. I would like to note that there is an addition to the south elevation of the building, which was constructed prior to 1970. On the facade, the brick veneered addition interrupts the continuity and pattern established by the red and pink porcelain enamel panels. Furthermore, the addition anchors the upswept cantilevered roof canopy to the building instead of the original design where it likely floated beyond the southern elevation. 
Nevertheless, these alterations do not negate the building's architectural value as it continues to express the core components of the Googie style. So on this slide and on the next slide, you can see the addition on the south elevation, which is pointed out by the red arrow, and a model of what we believe would have been the original design. And here is the building uh, currently, and again, uh, this is looking across uh, Fenton Street, looking east across Fenton Street, and what we believe the original design would have looked like when it was built in 1961. So next I'll move to our staff recommendations. Staff finds that the site meets two designation criteria related to architectural and design significance. The Weller's Dry Cleaning is a rare example of Googie commercial architecture in Montgomery County. Throughout the region, many of these architectural resources have been lost to demolition. Uh, the publication Montgomery Modern, uh, published in 2015, a chronicle of mid-century modern architecture in Montgomery County, documented just three commercial Googie style buildings. So overall, staff recommends that the HPC finds that the Weller Dry Cleaning Site meets the designation criteria as outlined in, in the county code, and that the HPC recommends that the planning board list Weller's Dry Cleaning in the Locational Atlas and Index of Historic Sites. Uh, thank you. Any questions for staff? Commissioner Barnes. Um, when did the process of consideration for potential listing begin? Is this something that's come up fairly recently, or has this been a long, kind of drawn out process? Uh, so the process, um, well, well the doesn't with the uh, completion of the Silver Spring and Downtown Adjacent Communities Plan, uh, the County Council approved that plan. And we moved, uh, particularly after the closure of the business, we moved uh, forward with uh, some contact with the property owner. I'll let uh, uh, Rebecca Ballo answer questions about contact with the property owner dating back to May. Um, to, to elaborate on Mr. Liebertz's reply, um, the, the consideration of this site for listing to the locational atlas was in the draft plan that was presented to the planning board in 2021. Mm -hmm. It was also part of the draft recommendations that were presented to the HPC at that time, and they were part of the historic preservation staff's outreach and presentations to the broader community at, at a number of meetings about what our potential recommendations were going to be. We, we had, um, the, the ownership of the property was such that we were able to make contact with the current owners in April of this, of this year. And I first spoke with, um, with the property owner in May about the process of the listing to the locational atlas, the timeline that was involved with that, and then the recent adoption of the plan by the county council. Because I, I seem to remember when there was a presentation to this group, and this was something that featured very prominently in, in that presentation, the Weller Dry Cleaning Establishment. And the, the council approved the Silver Spring um, plan okay, earlier this year, right? It was earlier this year. I can try and find okay. um, the exact date. They are still holding the public hearings, I believe, on some of the sectional map amendments and the zoning recommendations, but those are, are separate from this, what's Thank happening tonight. Thank you. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Burdett. Um, I would just like to add, since I live in the area, that it was a functioning dry cleaners up until, I think it was April of this year, March or April, something like that. Um, and uh, for Charlie was actually involved in the dry, dry cleaning on a regular basis, maybe not daily, but regular basis um, up until just maybe 2010, 2012, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it it was a part of Charlie and his, his dry cleaning was part of the community um, really up until fairly recently in history. Great, thank you. Any other questions for staff? Commissioner Doman. Uh, yes, this is um, kind of a off the topic, I guess, question, but um, I did take a, a drive by the building. I had, I'm not, I don't live in the area, so I went down to make sure I could see the building. Um, it's 
suffering a little bit of vandalism and some deterioration right now, but I understand it's been vacant for some time. But my real question is, is if this moves forward and becomes listed on the lo locational atlas, one of the prominent features of this building is the stark coloration, the bright red versus the bright white on the thing. And is that a criteria that we deem to be necessary to be maintained, or is a current owner of this free to paint this whatever color they wish? This is Rebecca Ballo for the record. That's a really excellent question. So the, the color is a, is a significant character defining feature of this building, and the color is not merely painted on these panels, it's baked into the steel enamel. So we would consider that similar to a rusticated brick or a stone where a, a historic area work permit is is required if you were to to paint a rusticated brick. Um, so it's really, it's not so much about um, just the application of the paint. But I think going back to what you said earlier about if it were to be listed on the locational atlas, well, let me clarify. Are you asking if it were listed to the locational atlas, would the HPC be involved in those decisions? Would it come to the staff? Or are you asking a procedural well, question? The, are we going to require that the owner maintain the, the definite red and white uh, exterior facade of the building? I mean, can I, you I, can I you turn on your? Sorry, phone. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I mean it's it's very. Um, I, I mean, I, I, not, not that I don't like it. I like the building. I like the strong colors on the thing and everything else. But, I th but in previous discussions, the exterior color was not a, um, something that we would dictate as far as the HPC. And I was wondering if, if this is different, and you have alluded to the fact that it's different, and we, that the owner would be required to maintain the white and the red then. It is different for the porcelain steel enamel panels, again, as, as an architectural feature with the color being baked into it in, in such a way. And for the significance of the Googie style, that bright technicolor coloration, I guess, is, is part of what makes it architecturally significant. But to your question about the locational atlas listing. So putting a property on the locational atlas is only a stay against demolition. That is the purpose of the locational atlas within the ordinance. And if a property owner were to come forward and then apply to demolish it, it's really meant to be just sort of a way station on the way to master plan listing. And then when a property is listed to the master plan and permits come in, that is where a lot of this discussion and adjudication about alterations to the property in front of the HPC really comes into play. So again, the locational atlas is meant to be much more of a blunt tool just to prevent the property from being demolished in, in the near term. Does that yeah. kind of get at? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Burdett? I'm sorry, did, um, Commissioner Pelletier, did you have a question? Yeah, I just had a okay. quick question. Get her first. Thanks. The window that is on, it's in the stone. Mm -hmm. Did that get added when the addition got added? Because those windows are the same. I'm just curious, that alteration. Are you talking about the windows on the left side of this image? Yeah. Um, I believe those windows are original from what I could tell. And you know, the little, the keystone above the, uh, above the window also suggest that those windows were original. Oh, because you're not stone. showing it on the model. Oh, yeah, that was, uh, I apologize. I uh, ran out of time model making, and uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't include yeah. those windows on it. I was trying to just really highlight the uh, more of the massings in the, in the glass than the, is the, the stone. Is the, do you know if the window in the brick is the same as the window in the stone? I'm just curious about that. You know, there, there, there is a question of who designed this edition. It's not clear to me if it was, you know, Ted Engelhar was still a very active in the field in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. um, so potentially he could have had a hand in it, but that's not in the historic record at all. Uh, but that window does match the, you know, the feel of the window that's in the stone veneered section. Right. And the, the awning on the right, would that sort of convey if this was to become 
Or I, is that was that added later? Are you know, there jealousy windows under that? Awning? I think that might take a little bit more investigation to see if those windows. I mean, if the if the awning was original to it, uh, it's you know maybe you could tell with some more examination of the how it's anchored to the building. Uh, that could have been a later addition. It's it's hard to tell mm -hmm. uh, what occurred. You know, if, if you know whether they just shifted that entire elevation further out, and that's what was there. If they added that as a for functionality at a later date. Uh, but, you know, I haven't heard anyone say that they remember those not being there. Um, but again, that's, that's just a hypothesis at this point. And, uh, you know, that, that could be decided. And again, as, uh, as Ms. Ballow was saying, you know, as if this was to move forward as a master plan, to, you know, through the review process for the master plan for historic preservation, there would be some, I, there can be some guidance in that master plan document about treatments of materials, treatments of elevations, you know, what's supposed to be preserved and what's not supposed to be preserved. But, you know, for the location of Atlas hearing, which was, as she was saying about the stay of demolition, potentially, you know, those, those types, types of topics are usually addressed later. Okay, great, thanks. Commissioner Burdett. Uh, staying on the same topic, if it's going to be on the locational Atlas, are the tax credits available to it while it's on the Atlas or you know, for exterior repairs? Uh, so properties on the locational outlets are not eligible for historic preservation tax credits. You have to be listed on the master plan for historic preservation for that. And those tax credits would apply to all repairs and renovations to the exterior that c comply with the guidelines? Yes, yeah, so it would apply to all exterior renovation projects that qualify for the tax credits. Um, one last question. Is there a Ted Inglehart brick somewhere on this building since he was known to have his pressed brick somewhere? Yes, there is a Ted Engelhart brick on the uh, on the subject building. There is that identifies it as a uh, one of his works. Signature. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If there are no more questions, um, this time I'll turn to the owners and um, I have um, and please Forgive me if I mispronounce your name. <laughs> um, I have Mr. Um, Dagmawi Laku and Ms. Bakalak, Bakalek Della, Della Lang. I'm sorry, I apologize if you can, but if you could come forward to the um, microphones and um, turn them on. Uh, you will have a total of seven minutes to give your testimony and um, then if you could accept questions, that would be terrific. And if you could state your names for the record um, before your testimony, we would appreciate that very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to start. This is Sean Hughes. I'm the attorney for them from Miller, Miller and Canby. Hopefully you got our letter that we sent the other day. Okay. Um, I'll try to be brief and then turn it over to the owners. Um, so, um, as we put in the letter, we, we first would ask that HBC. Um, yeah, can we? Well, yeah, we're sure. Coming. Yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. We would respectfully ask that you all put this on a short uh, continuance. Uh, we were just engaged last week, and this process is um, one that they're unfamiliar with, and they're very concerned about potential implications. And so they were looking to try to get a consultant, historical consultant, who could help them understand the process and understand what's being presented and the implications and provide um, a perspective from, from, for them. Um, what we also got late yesterday, and I forwarded on the staff, but I know it was after the deadline, so it may not have made it into your packet, but I did bring copies here to submit. Um, one of the other reasons we alluded to in our letter is that we do have significant concerns about the environment there, about the building and the earth. And so, Rebecca, did, should I hand out copies or did that email make it? Into sure, the sure, please pass it out. Okay. The short version is that um, uh, we got, th through the real estate agent that they've worked with unsolicited, we got, they got an email from Mr. Brian Dietz from the Maryland Department of Environment. And um, I'll, I'll hand this out in one second, but essentially, in a, well, thank you. There's eight copies I got lucky, I think. Um, and essentially in the first paragraph he said that um, he has concerns about the building and the property 
about people potentially going in it without extensive more studies. He said property is currently subject of an ongoing environmental investigation due to present of presence of extensive soil gas and groundwater contamination under the building and associated with the parking lot. So again, for these significant reasons, we would, you know, the building's been there 60 years. They just bought it last summer. Um, we would respectfully ask that HBC be willing to give them a little bit of time to all of us actually, everyone should be interested in what the impact to the earth is there. And uh, there was no mention of that obviously in the staff report. So this is new information for everyone. And um, what I'd like to say is, is, is that what, that's what we're asking for. We'd ask for a continuance, I'm gonna let them speak or we'd ask for a denial, but they're very concerned about the impact this could have on their plans. So with that, I will turn it over to, um, and I'll try to, Mr. Chairman, I might not do a better name, but I'll try to pronounce it because I was able to ask them how to. So Ms. De Della Lane and then her son, Mr. Lacau. They might just have something briefly they want to say. <coughs> My name is Bakalich Chilma, Bakalich Dallale. I did. My name is Bakalich. I'm from Ethiopia. As you see me, I'm black and woman. And I was working very hard to be here. And this cleaners is in that place before I came to this world. And we bought this place as 2021 and how do you choose this place to be historic and what is the criteria to be historic and if you see that place and what we are expecting to spend for environmental I take all that risk I took all that risk to buy this place. And I don't know how you choose it. I don't know how, if I knew, I'm not going to buy it. Because I'm not rich, I'm trying to get somewhere, but I don't expect this kind of thing to happen. And please, think about it. You know, after I spend my money, and within about seven or nine, eight months to happen this is really sad. And I was with my husband during that time. Now I lost my husband because of pandemic. And I don't have time even to go around. I don't have money to spend for the lawyer. And I don't know how you come and say, this is historic. And please, I'm just begging you just to see. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Doug Maui Lago. I'm the son of the owner. Um, so since we the main point that she was making, which um, needs to be understood, is that since we purchased this building, this property, when we purchased it, this was not in the plan. So we have our own plans. And plus, it's very easy to recommend something as historic, as we heard the presentation earlier, but that entire history was just the Wellers, the Wellers family. It's not the Wellers dry cleaners anymore. The dry cleaners had stopped operating since the pandemic, they officially moved out um, earlier, as you mentioned, around April of this year. They officially moved out, but they hadn't been operating since the pandemic. And uh, their lease when we purchased the property was until 2029. And because they hadn't been operating and they were going under, they, they had requested to just terminate their lease. And we happily granted that wish as their landlords because there was a lot of environmental issues 
connected with the property and we just wanted it to just come to an end. As long as it had the Weller's name on it, those issues would just continue because people don't understand that that place is not a dry cleaners anymore. No. Even now, today, it's still listed as the Weller's Dry Cleaners. Weller's. It's not a dry cleaners. It hasn't been for some time now. So this is something that needs to be taken into consideration as you know, you make this decision. And since the very beginning of this process, I've expressed how we're not interested in designating it as historic. That is not our plan for the property. When we bought it, we were not aware of such designation. So it's, it's, our stance on this, on this issue has been very clear since the very beginning, since they reached out and we spoke about this. So. Um, that's all I have. I do wish you'd grant the extension so we can um, look into this further and try to understand what is happening, because to us, this is all New. foreign. That's all. Thank you. Um, are there any questions for the owners and the representative? Commissioner Barnes. Um, I'm going to ask you a question and then I'm also going to make just a comment about the role that we play on the Historic Preservation Commission. One, you've spoken a couple of times, either you or your mother, about your intentions when you purchased the property and my understanding is you purchased it in 2021, yeah. if that's correct. So I'm interested in hearing what it is you thought to do with this property, and what consultations, if any, you may have had with anyone in Silver Spring about the area that you were buying in. So that's the question for you. The comment is that you've uh, said you really don't want any kind of historic designation. You don't think it is historic. We will consider a building when it's over 50 years old. And we look for a variety of things. We look for architectural significance. And I think you've heard a little bit about that from the excellent staff report. We also look for cultural significance, and that came up also in the staff report, and you also heard about it from one of the commissioners who recalls that this has been a part of Silver Spring for many, many years. And I take your point that it is no longer Weller Dry Cleaner, but what we as a commissioner are looking at is the architectural and cultural significance. And now I'd be very grateful if one of you, your mother, you, would uh, address my question about what you had intended and what kind of research you did before acquiring the property. You, I think you know it, Addis Ababa restaurant. Addis Ababa restaurant, beside the cleaner, that's I serve the community as a restaurant over 10 years to that place. And the next pro property is there. That one is a parking lot. And now, you know, always you think to grow. And I said, if I buy this one, the dry cleaning, I might do something like develop a building. You know, that's a dream. And that's why, you know, I tried to buy this place. And when I buy that place, the, the real estate was very respectful. Everybody was very nice. And they didn't hide anything. And they didn't mention about uh, in, about this. We didn't know at all. And that's why I bought it to, de to develop. But this plan maybe, it might take, this plan maybe it takes three years or four years. For that purpose, now I want to rent the, dr the dry cleaning because as I told you, I'm by myself and my children are beside me. 
my husband is not here. I have to pay to the mortgage. Even I was expecting, you know, a good citizenship. I was working hard. Even I was expecting something from, like a prize from the community, from the <clears throat> county, not, you know. I bought that building and, building and said that, oh, this is going to be this. I didn't expect that at all. And then never, no one mentioning to me until uh, maybe in May or June 1, I was not in a good condition because of my husband. And I heard that and I said, oh, that can't happen. Why? And now it's coming and coming and coming. Today I am here. That's the only thing I know. Any other, question, any other questions for the owners? Commissioner Doman. Are, <clears throat> are there any outstanding environmental issues? Because this was a, a dry cleaner and they used um, perchloroethylene and different chemicals in the process. I understand there's an environmental either survey or something's being done on the property right now. Um, is there, I was trying to think, you own the property, but, but is there a legacy um, financial burden for you to clean up anything that's on this property? And when you, you bought the property as is, apparently, you didn't know that this was pending for historic preservation, but there's also environmental issues associated with this. Are you, is anybody, I got this letter from uh, State Assessment for Remediation Division. Um, are you, do you face potential remediation expenses to clean this place up? Uh, that's, my, that's my question. Mm. I had a good experience for that. If, oh, I'm okay, sorry, go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. If, um, I'm not sure if you've ever dealt with dry cleaners, just so happens that we have with one other property. The extent of the contamination or the damage in that place, we don't know yet. We have no clue. We're just in the early, early stages of finding out because of the letters that you just got handed to you. The Maryland Department of Environment is asking that we work with an outside company, a private company, to try to figure out and come up with a plan to see what is going to be done on that property. When we bought it, going back to, to kind of go back to the first question also, um, the easiest and the cheapest way as because the place is so old and it's actually a hundred times worse on the interior than it is on the outside from what you see. Um, the best way to just do that is to, you know, dig up the place and get rid of the, the, the soil that's there. If you want to try to remediate it as it is, the extent is millions. We had um, we had a property in D.C. Like I said, it's just very coincidentally that it happened to be a dry cleaners. Also, the EPA had stepped in to try and remediate a similar issue with the chemicals. We never got the bill for it because it was a different kind of case, but we know that it was millions. So for this property to just stay the way it is and be, we can designate it as historic and keep the actual physical property there, but who takes care of this bill that's gonna come later for millions to remediate what's, what's underneath? And it might even be, it might not just be that one property, it may be neighboring properties. So we have no idea what the extent is. So we're just in the early stages of trying to figure that out. Commissioner Burdett. Um. There are, there have been other properties in Silver Spring with very similar issues because there was a building called the Dry Cleaning Institute. I don't hear you. Um, that is now a residential, is a multifamily residential building. So abatement is feasible. 
and it'll depend on the assessment of the property. Um, and I, you know, the the state might have funds available to abate. We can't address that. Our, you know, this we're strictly historic and basing our judgment on the criteria that the staff presented in their reports. Uh, Commissioner, though, isn't environmental uh, something that does factor into the overall consideration of this HBC? Significant environmental on the property? This it, is Rebecca could, Ballow, for the yeah, record. No, it, it, does, it yeah. does not um, for the Historic Preservation Commission. It is architectural and cultural significance. The boundary of the site is called an environmental setting, but really that means the boundary within which the HPC has its purview. So the, the criteria are laid out in 24A3. For designation right I, I, I see that and maybe again we were just trying to get our own consultant and the first consultant I talked to did say that that is a factor now it may not be right in this code maybe it's a broader one or maybe I'm incorrect but it would seem that that has to in the real world that has to play some factor some consideration I have a question any other questions me here <laughs> yes. <laughs> how do you choose when you say, how, how is the criteria to say this is historical? How do you go and look, a sec you know, because what it makes me wonder uh, where to that area, and I heard that for a long time, the dry cleaning was there. And why nobody mentioned that it's going to be historic? Why after I bought, even it's not a year, why, it's, why this become historic? That's very amazing me. How? How do you think now? Why it was not five years ago, 10 years ago? Why you didn't say that? Because I'm... Um, I don't want to see it, okay. I just stop here. Just um, to provide a little bit more background, in terms of the review of this property by the planning department, back in 2002, when there was the Central, Bis Central Business District survey done for Silver Spring after the demolition of the armory, uh, that consultant report also identified this, even when it was younger than 50 years old, that it was something that the county may want to consider for potential designation at a later date. So, you know, and that's a, that has it's been a, a public report. So there has been information about this building uh, that the, through survey reports and other such documents uh, dating back uh, some time now. Uh, but it was, again, probably more prominently brought up as part of the Silver Spring and Downtown Adjacent Communities Plan. Thank you. Um, if you could, oh, Commissioner Doman, what question is this question? Just a short question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> If I understand correctly what you're saying, when you bought the property a year ago, there was, you did not know that this property was potentially historic. Nobody, the, the real estate agent didn't tell you anything. The bank, the closing, nobody informed you. Neighbors didn't tell you. You bought this with no idea that this was a potentially historic building. Is that correct? Exactly, that's yeah. correct. Okay, so I, have a, I got a question. So one, one more question. Oh, sorry. Commissioner Pelletier. Sorry, this is Commissioner Pelletier. I'm sorry. So no, I just have a comment. Oh, com Commissioner Radu. This is Commissioner Radu in response a little bit to um, the owner's question. I have a book here, and uh, the staff report mentioned it too. It was been published in 2015, and it has it features a prominently this property. So this is not a new thing, and it doesn't have anything to do with your purchase okay thank you oh thank you commissioner pelletier well my question is a question it is a thank question you. but it's <laughs> not to the owners it's more to the group and this is a no 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 if it's to the group we need to do this later this is no. questions to the owner thank you Under if this is a question discussion. to this is, has to be a question to the owner then we will we will have this as part of our deliberation okay okay thank you if there are no more questions for the owner um you can you can step back and I have one more testimony from um, Deborah Chalf Chalfie, uh, and you can come forward, and you, you will have five minutes. 
Notiert. And if you could state your name for the record, we would appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. And, and if you could also state your organization. I will do that. Thank you. Am I on? Can you hear uh, the, okay? the red. It's red. No, it green. It has to be green. Okay. Better. Great. Terrific. Okay. Good evening, Chairman Sutton and members of the Historic Preservation Commission. I'm Deborah Chalfie, the Preservation Chair of the Art Deco Society of Washington. We appreciate the opportunity to testify today in strong support for listing Weller's Dry Cleaning Building and signage in the county's locational atlas and historic uh, index of historic sites. The Art Deco Society is a nonprofit membership organization covering the Washington area. Our mission is to foster awareness of, celebrate, and preserve the architectural, decorative, industrial, and cultural arts of the Art Deco era and adjacent modern movements of the 20th century. ADSW commends the Historic Preservation staff for their excellent and expeditious work in bringing forward the proposed listing of Weller's Dry Cleaning in the Locational Atlas. We think they've produced a compelling and thorough report in support of designation. Weller's Dry Cleaning is an excellent specimen of the exuberant form of mid-century modern architecture known as Googie architecture. And as the staff points out, Wellers amply meets at least two of the criteria for architectural and design significance. In our testimony, our written testimony, which you should have received, we also argue that other criteria are highly relevant here and should be considered in favor of designation. For example, uh, criterion 2B, the resource that represents, represents the work of a master. Um, we consider Weller's assigned work of Ted Engelhart, and whether he could be considered a master or not, he was certainly a prolific local architect who created much of the built environment in mid-century modern in mid-century Montgomery County. The second criterion is uh, protecting resources, criterion 1D, that exemplify among other things, the cultural and historic heritage of the county and communities. Googie architecture was both a creature and a beneficiary of car culture and a dominant element of mid-century suburbanization of Silver Spring and the county as a whole. The building and the signage reflect that culture. Also, though not a criterion, another factor that we think weighs heavily in favor of preservation here is rarity. Unfortunately, very few examples of Googie architecture in the county have survived development. It's absolutely vital to protect a unique, well-preserved, surviving example such as Weller's as a historic resource. And time is of the, of the essence. Almost immediately after Weller's closed in April, the building was vandalized and graffitied. Weller's dry cleaning has long been identified by planners, preservationists, and community residents as a gem to be preserved. As John just noted, uh, it was in the predecessor CBD plan for the latest uh, uh, so Silver Spring downtown and adjacent community plan. So it's already been long identified. We think the time is now to move from studying uh, whether this should be designated to taking action to protect this resource. And I just want to comment um, on one thing that the owner said, which is that somehow having to deal with testing the, the building for uh, toxic substances or remediating it is somehow inconsistent with protecting this building as a resource. I don't see those two things as inconsistent. And in fact, 
Uh, it's my understanding, after looking into uh, what it means to be involved with the voluntary cleanup program, it's my understanding that until things get addressed, the building cannot be really disturbed in any significant way because that could aggravate the, the environmental issues. And so keeping the building intact, <laughs> which is what putting it in the atlas mainly does, is thoroughly consistent with addressing whatever environmental issues remain. My, uh, the other thing I understand from talking with that department is that there was not a very big issue around environment as long as the building remained to dry cleaners, and which apparently it was when these owners bought it and continued to be after these owners bought it. What, what arises as a new issue is if the building is no longer used as a dry cleaners. And that raises some concerns about needing to test and see if any remediation is required. I don't know if that will be minor or whether that would be extensive. That would be something to consult with the environmental department about. But um, we urge you to vote to recommend listing this building and its signage as an integrated whole in the atlas to forward that recommendation to the planning board as soon as possible. And we also urge this commission to follow up with a recommendation for designation in the master plan for historic preservation as soon as you can. Amendment to the plan would not only trigger additional protections for the building, it would also unleash financial assistance, which Commissioner Burdett was asking about, to help the owner restore and preserve the resource and seek thoughtful and appropriately sensitive ways to adaptively reuse the building. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Chalfie? Yes. Commissioner <laughs> Doman. When I went by the building yesterday, there's a sign that says, uh, Notice of Application Received, Voluntary Cleanup Program. Could you explain what the Voluntary Cleanup Program is all about? <laughs> well, that, I, would, I would encourage you to consult Brian Dietz of, of that program, but I had the same question when I learned about that sign. So I called them up and I asked what it meant. And they said that, to give you the short answer, they said that there needs to be a plan to ensure that if the building is going to be used for something other than a dry cleaners, they need to do some on-site testing to make sure that there aren't, you know, uh, uh, bad fumes or, so, you know, that, that it's safe for customers and for the business that moves in. And that if there were issues, they may need to have some kind of system to vent fumes like you do with radon or something like that. But again, I am not an expert <laughs> in right. environmental remediation, but that's what, that's what they told me because I didn't know what it meant either. But they did say that disturbing the building substantially altering it or demolishing it or doing anything like that would um, raise significant environmental concerns where those concerns do not presently exist. Yeah, this Thank is you. all true. Um, do you, so that, that sign is out there has nothing to do with, you're not involved with that, right? I am not involved with that. I just had the same questions you did and about what it meant. Is it a, well, okay, you don't know. I guess I'll have to follow up um, because I was curious what, when it says volunteer, what that really means, but you don't know. It's, it's, I do know that it's where the department works with the owner voluntarily to take care of the problem rather than pursuing it as an enforcement action. So it's in contrast to being more directive. Um, but that's about all I can tell you. What I do know, like I say though, is that designating this building in the Atlas is not inconsistent with the ability of the owners to work cooperatively with the environmental department to take care of those issues. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Burdett. Ms. Chalfie, your organization has been before us before in support of other properties. Um, your organization has been involved with several significant 
adaptive reuses of buildings in Silver Spring and in the greater DC area. Um, can you very briefly mention a couple of those projects? Sure. Um, as Commissioner Burr said, we cover the entire area. Um, for example, uh, the Art Deco Society was very involved in helping to save the uh, Silver Theater and the Silver Spring Shopping Center in this area. Um, those were already a theater and a shopping center, so it wasn't so much an adaptive reuse as a, as a restoration. But we were also very involved in helping to um, save the Hex Warehouse building on New York Avenue. Um, that is now an apartment building. Um, our, our organization provided consistent uh, um, advocacy and advice with regard to that building. Um, most recently, uh, the Art Deco Society helped with and worked with other preservation groups to move the old waffle shop that used to be downtown across the street from Ford's Theater, which is now, they, they actually deconstructed it and reconstructed it um, on uh, 6th and K, and it's now an Italian restaurant. Um, so we've been involved in a number of um, situations, you know, the Canada Dry uh, uh, building and others, where those buildings have been, or at least parts of the buildings, have been saved to, uh, to be used in other ways. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you for the opportunity You're to testify, and please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. Now we will begin our deliberations. Um, would anyone like to start off on this project? Commissioner Pelletier, you were itching to ask us questions, as I recall. Yeah, I think I've changed. <laughs> what you can do at this point. <laughs> I've changed my mind about that. Oh, OK. Um, well, I, I have not I have not I, I don't know. This came up on another project, uh, whose responsibility it is to inform a potential buyer is it the is it the real estate agent is it like you know or is it it's sort of incumbent on the buyer to do their own research to figure out you know if there's something funky about the property that they don't know about because we did have another i can't remember the i can't remember which one it was but there was another similar situation where the buyers were not aware of the property status when it was purchased, but. I, I believe to answer your question, and staff can probably help me with this, but the, the responsibility is not to inform anybody that a building is historic unless it has some kind of a designation that says it's historic. Okay. And in this case, I believe there was no designation. It was part of a sector plan that it was a, an interesting building, but it had no designation as historic, and so therefore there was no there was no responsibility from the previous owner or the lending institution to say that this building is historic. And I believe that's correct. Is that? Yes, that is correct. OK, okay. thank you. OK, so that's one thing. But the second thing is, I just Googled Weller's dry cleaning. And this article came up from 2011 talking about how the resource is not listed on the local atlas or designated. Then down at the bottom, it says that there are plans. Um, for, it is on the 2002 survey of CBD resources. And uh, there, there's a number of comments here that would imply that this is going to go forward as a potential historic property. And that was just a quick Google search of the property. So I kind of think. There is some responsibility on the owner to do a little digging, especially because this building is a beloved his Silver Spring building. And if you're from the area, you know anything about it, you know Weller's dry cleaning. That's one point. The other point is that if the owner had experience with purchasing dry cleaners in the past, I know they're problematic as far as environmental stuff goes because I've dealt with them myself. So if that was, if if that was in the owner's knowledge that this was going to be an issue as far as the chemicals and stuff goes, I think they kind of knew that was coming. I didn't buy. I didn't buy the dry cleaning. No. This is beside 
Uh, thank you. We, we, um, if we have a question for you, we will ask you. Sorry. I'm sorry. I thought it was your son that said that. Oh, you didn't buy that property. Oh, I see. Right. So that is some, that's my point is that you've had experience not buying a property, but have experience with the dry cleaner and know the potential issues with it. So I, I think there was some buyer beware in this property. Um, that's kind of my point. Thank you. Would anyone else like to contribute? Um, Commissioner Barnes. Um, I have a lot of sympathy for the owners of this property, and I am thinking I'm always a little confused in Silver Spring that I've been into an Ethiopian-owned coffee shop on Fenton Street that's very nice um, and has very good coffee, which is not surprising if you've ever had the privilege of being in Ethiopia, which I have. Um, but that said, no matter how strongly I am sympathetic with the owners and the fact that they have purchased a property and suddenly feel that they're confronted by a number of governmental organizations that seem to be thwarting their plans to move forward, what we here are doing is trying to assess the value of this structure in terms of its historic architectural and cultural significance. And I am fully supportive of the recommendation that the staff is made to put this property on the locational atlas. What that would mean in your case is that you couldn't seek to demolish it. It still would give you the opportunity to work with environmental people to see what could be done to remediate because as I am understanding the letter you have received, you can't rent the property at the present time to anyone other than possibly a dry cleaner until you've sorted the environmental issues. So if we move forward, if the majority of the commissioners support this recommendation, we are not denying you the use of the property. We are merely affirming what we view it to be, which is a significant property in Silver Spring. And as I say, I'm fully supportive of the recommendation. Thank you. Anyone else? I've Commissioner Burdett. Um, as I said earlier, I live in the area and my family used the dry cleaners for 20 plus years. Um, and what isn't really appreciated by a lot of people, um, Wellers is kind of unique because it's very recognizable and understandable, but what isn't appreciated is in the next block south and the next block north are also two very fine examples of mid-century commercial properties, very fine designs. They probably will not survive because they're not eye-catching enough. Um, now, Fenton Village, is a thriving, busy community, and that is almost entirely owed to the way the Ethiopian community has taken it as their own and embraced it, and that is very much appreciated by the, the residents around and you know the greater Silver Spring community. This property is, is eye-catching, and it would, I can't imagine that if you were able to rent it, you wouldn't be able to rent it in a heartbeat to anybody who wanted to put a cafe, a restaurant, you know, whatever, coffee shop, whatever they wanted into it because it would be an ideal location. By putting it on the locational atlas, it is protected. <clears throat> By going forward with full historic designation on the master plan, that would open up resources to you, a great many resources, financial resources, at the county level, at the state level, and at the national level to rehabilitate this building. And that is worth keeping in mind that you will have resources available to you if you support this designation 
and if it moves through very quickly. Um, and as well, once it the once this gets out that this is designated, it will actually improve the value of your property because it will once it's restored, it'll be eye catching. It'll be a, the sharpest place on Fenton Street and the most desirable place on Fenton Street to operate a business, to have a restaurant or a cafe or what whatever activity you want to put into it, and there are multiple options that would be very desirable. So I think you just need to, I know this is very frustrating, and it's, and it's not something you pre really understand why we think this is a great building, because it is, it is dates back to an, a period before you, know, you came to the country, and frankly, before I was born, but it's, it is a unique building. And because of that, people like it a lot. They appreciate it. They want to save it. And it isn't just us. It's other people within the community. And I think, I think you will find that if you are accepting of this and going with this and getting it designated on the master plan, you will achieve greater income than if you just you know, try to not get it designated and tear it down. As a follow-up to that, there's an article in Forbes magazine, I believe it's August 2018, that cites a number of um, studies that have been done about historic properties. And it's very clear that the, that when it's designated historic, it adds value. It, it becomes more valuable. And I recommend that to you. Any other, any other comments and deliberations? <laughs> Commissioner Doman, one more. It's Commissioner Doman. Um, I guess I come from this a little different angle on this thing. Um, having read the uh, letter that the lawyer submitted on behalf of the applicant, um, I, I would like to see um, additional time. I think that's what they asked for, is that this came up more or less to them, not prior to May. They didn't know about some of the situations as per pertaining to the property. and. I, th I don't really think they necessarily disagree with everything. I think that this may have been a shock or a surprise to them, and what the letter asked for was additional time, and not that we approve it at this particular meeting to put it on the locational atlas, but that we give the client, or the applicant in this case, um, additional time to do some research on it and see what they have, what they bought into. And um, I, I would lean towards not acting on it at this particular meeting, and I'd like to give them uh, another month or so to see what, they, what the situation is, if they could yeah. possibly find a reuse for this, which I think would, would probably be, as has been enumerated, they could do something with the property. <laughs> But I think they need maybe a little bit more time to think about it and then just come back. And uh, I'd like to give them another month. So that's where I stand. Um, with that, I think we can end our deliberations. And I would welcome a, um, uh, a motion. Um, I believe we have two options. We have not had a chance to read this letter from, um, from the owner's representative. Um, I have not had a chance to. Um, and so I believe one of the options could be that we could delay our decision um, and have time to look at this, or we can uh, take the information that we have, which I think goes on, which is pretty complete, extremely complete, and very thorough, and decide whether or not we would like to include this in the locational atlas. So I would welcome a, a motion. Uh, this is Commissioner Burdett. I would like to make a motion that based on the staff's recommendations and reports that we vote to uh, uh, approve this. Um, I'm not sure it's an approval. We, I think we're recommending. We're recommending. We're recommending. Yeah. We'll, we will um, broadcast out the staff computer again with the staff recommendation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
um, that we find that the Weller's dry cleaning meets the designation criteria as outlined in 24A-3 of the county code and that the commission will recommend that the planning board list Weller's dry cleaning in the locational atlas and index of historic sites. Is there a second? Um, I second the motion. I would like to do a roll call, um, yay or nay, starting with Commissioner Nasser. And this is Commissioner toward, Nasser. In my direction. <laughs> <laughs> this is Commissioner Nasser. I support the um, staff's recommendation. Thank you. Commissioner Radu. Yes, I support the, the recommendation. Commissioner Haynes. Yes. Commissioner Burdett. Yes. Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Commissioner Doman. Commissioner Doman, nay, no. Commissioner Pelletier. Yes. And I'm Commissioner, or Ch Chair Sutton. <laughs> I was a commissioner at one point. <laughs> and I vote yes as well. So the vote is, uh, I believe, 7 to 1, recommending that it be um, submitted to the uh, Planning Commission for approval to be listed in the, on the uh, locational atlas. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you very much. And thank you. And we, we are very, very much looking forward to working with you. Um, on this property. We, we believe it's very important and we want to do everything we can to help with it. So thank you so much for coming before us and we look forward to working with you in the future. Okay. Now, would anyone, is everybody okay to continue right now or do you want to take a five minute break or? We can, if you would like to take a, a quick five minute. I'm fine, if any, unless no, anybody our, else would like to. Would you like to take a break? <laughs> We're, our applicants are here for the next um, okay. couple of cases. All right. So um, moving on here, uh, this, no, I, do I not hear that everybody needs, or everybody okay moving on? Okay, great. Um, so we will move on to our historic area work permits. Um, and we will, uh, we will look at the, the, first of all, look at the, per, at the applications that we believe can very easily be approved. First yes. of all, have these been advertised? Has the, have these projects been advertised? Yes, they were advertised in the September 7th edition of the Washington Times. Thank you very much. Now, is there anyone here to speak in opposition to any of the following projects? Number 2C at um, 8 Primrose Street, Chevy Chase. 8D, or excuse me, 2D at 21 Philadelphia Avenue, Tacoma Park. 2E at 49 Elm Avenue, Tacoma Park. 2F at 5537 Lambeth Road, Bethesda. 2G at 4701 Cumberland Avenue, Chevy Chase. 2H at 10701 Keswick Street, Garrett Park. Mr. Chair, hearing no objections, I move that we approve the following historic area work permits in accordance with the staff reports based upon the record before us and in consideration of the recommendations of the local advisory panels and including any conditions recommended by staff. Hop number 1004381 at 8 Primrose Street, Chevy Chase. Hop number 1004962 at 21 Philadelphia Avenue, Tacoma Park. Hop number 1004874 at 49 Elm Avenue, Tacoma Park. Hop number 1004210 at 5537 Lambeth Road, Bethesda. Hop number 1005314 at 4701 Cumberland Avenue, Chevy Chase. Hop number 512967 revision at 10701 Keswick Street, Carrot Park. Is there a second? This is Commissioner Haynes, I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. All of these have been approved and, thank, and I want to thank the owners for giving us projects that could very easily be approved. If there are any questions um, moving forward, you're welcome to speak to staff starting tomorrow. Next, we will hear project uh, number two, um, two A 
at uh, 6712 Westmoreland Avenue, Tacoma Park. Is there a staff report? Uh, yes, there is, Mr. Chair. This is the staff report for 6712 Westmoreland Avenue in Tacoma Park. It was constructed in 1923 and is designated as a contributing resource to the Tacoma Park Historic District. Um, as such, it's to be reviewed under the Tacoma Park guidelines, the Secretary of the Interior Standards, and Chapter 24A. Uh, the applicant proposes to um, rehabilitate the house from a, a vacant residential property and turn it into a single family house, including removing and raising the roof, constructing building additions, uh, replacing the non-historic vinyl windows and demolishing a non-historic outbuilding. Additionally, the applicant proposes uh, to remove the existing aluminum siding and restore the wood siding underneath and um, replicate the decorative brackets where necessary. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, this is the subject property along Westmoreland. Uh, you see the, the grade raises significantly up from the street level. Um, because the property has been vacant and, and the landscape has been allowed to grow, the house is, is difficult to view in, in two-dimensional photographs, but is a little easier on, on site visits. Um, and then this is, you see the, the house is almost completely obscured by the vegetation, looking at it from, from the right side. Um, and then from the rear, you see the grade comes up. You'll also note that the property to the left has a, a large rear addition um, behind it as well. So this is the schematic of the proposal, which will raise the roof ridge to accommodate a, a front-facing gable dormer and a rear gable dormer. There's also a small 10-foot uh, bump out at the rear of the first floor. So because of, of the, grade and cha the, the change in grade, and you can see the topo lines here, um, it, it is difficult to impossible to expand the the main floor out without excavating the hills substantially, uh, which is why a, a second story is, is almost necessary to enlarge the building in this instance. Uh, you'll also note the location of, of the shed, um, which was proposed for demolition. So uh, we'll have a number of comparisons between the existing condition and proposed. Uh, you see front addition with a, a low pitched uh, single story roof. Uh, we'll note that the existing Attic is, is occupied, but the height in the interior is only six feet, six inches tall. So the previous, uh, previous owner had, had that space occupied, but that does not satisfy current code requirements. Um, also on these side elevations, there is a, a dashed line showing uh, the uh, historic roof compared to the proposed, and this shows it a little, a little better. Um, so we see the roof raises up a significant amount, but it allows for um, both a, a front-facing dormer and then uh, the rear addition in the back. So uh, in the first floor plan, or the main floor plan, um, there are no changes proposed for the, uh, the basement level. Uh, there is a 10-foot, 4-inch bump out to the rear. Uh, the walls are inset by approximately 8 inches on, on either side. Uh, the second floor is, is all brand new because it was just attic space that was not supposed to be legally occupied. Uh, and you see that, that there are four be uh, bedrooms proposed for the rear um, in addition to the 10 foot four bump out that's happening on the first floor. The second floor will extend an additional 13 feet towards the rear. Uh, again, that's accommodated largely through the ch natural change in grade on the site. And then we have the roof plan, the, the new roof plan showing the front dormer and the rear gable. Uh, staff finds that removing the aluminum siding and restoring the, the wood siding does not require a hop, but is eligible for the County Historic Preservation Tax Credit. Additionally, the, the metal shed is not a historic structure and, and may be removed as a matter of course. Uh, the existing six foot six inch height in the attic is too low to be occupied. And because of the site's change in grade, an addition to the subject property requires either a significant excavation of the hillside or a second story addition. Uh, staff will also note that um, depending on, on the source, the, the house is either 800 or 850 square feet uh, with a single bedroom. So it's a, a very small single family residence. Uh, staff generally disfavors removing the roof and adding a second story, um, but acknowledges the size of, of the house um, 
maybe an instance where, where this is a, a allowable or, or approvable. Uh, the Tacoma Park guidelines do allow for second story additions um, with a couple of provisions, uh, specifically that the addition is generally consistent with the predominant architectural style, craftsman in this case, and should be appropriate for the surrounding streetscape in terms of scale and massing. Uh, raising the roof will allow legal occupation of, of the second floor. Staff additionally f finds that the proposed roof removal and replacement is consistent with the craftsman architecture of the house and that the, the new height will not overwhelm the scale and massings of the house on the south side of Westmoreland Avenue, two of which you saw in, in the slides earlier. Uh, staff finds the front dormer addition is consistent with the size and character of the subject property as well. Um, staff finds that the proposed rear gable addition is not out of scale with the house and that its placement directly behind the historic massing of the house will limit its visibility from the public right of way. Uh, and that's uh, something that's prescribed by the design guidelines. We'll also note that um, we can go back to the photo if you'd like, but the rear addition of the house on the right is um, barely visible from the public right of way. And that's a substantial addition out the rear as well. Uh, staff finds that the materials proposed for the new construction, including fiber cement siding and asphalt shingles, are appropriate for new construction, construction and additions to contributing resources in the Tacoma Park Historic District. Um, as the existing windows are vinyl and not historic, they may be removed. However, staff does not find the proposed gelled wind vinyl windows and doors to be an appropriate replacement due to their material incompatibility. Um, because the historic windows have been removed, staff finds an appropriately detailed wood or aluminum clad window is an appropriate replacement. Uh, these windows would need to have proper proportions and permanently affixed grills with interior spacer bars. Uh, however, staff recommends the HPC at a condition that uh, delegates final approval authority for a replacement window satisfying those criteria to staff and otherwise recommends the HPC approve the hop. Are there any questions for staff? Yes, any questions? Commissioner Burdett. Uh, when the applicant was working with the staff to, I, I, let me rephrase this. Did the applicant come to the staff with the plan as it is for the second floor, or did the staff and applicant work towards what is on, in the report now? So there was a, a previous scheme presented as part of a HOP application that did add a second floor to uh, the subject property. Um, the review staff collectively uh, found that that proposal would have um, a more significant impact on the massing of the house, uh, that the addition, the, the second floor addition went uh, to the front wall plane, but that's not under consideration as part of this HOP. So um, staff relied on, on guidance from other properties, both on, on the block and in the surrounding area, um, and other building additions in, in the Tacoma Park District, pr pr primarily in, um, along Westmoreland and Walnut, there, there were enough building additions that we could use those as, as case studies to, um, to guide the applicant into this current proposal. When you were working with the applicant, I mean, um, if, if you could pull the f second floor plan up, um, there you go. Was there any discussion about reorganizing the second floor plan so that it would not require such a, a significant roof change, massing change to this house? Well, I, I mean, again, most of most of the addition is is inset from the historic wall planes and under a rear gable roof that is going to be behind the new gable roof. So, you know, when when viewed from the public right of way, staff um, determined, or or in, in staff's evaluation, um, the rear addition would be less visible from the public right of way, so it would have a less significant impact on the character of the resource in the surrounding district. Uh, if you look at the photo presented here, mm -hmm. um, you know, you'll know you note that both the, the rear addition to the property on the left and the solar panels are virtually invisible from the public right of way. Now some of that has to do with the fact that these lots are only 42 feet wide and the side setbacks are relatively narrow. Uh, but staff, in, in staff's estimation or interpretation, the, uh, the rear addition will not be highly visible from the right of way and its mass will not have a substantial impact on 
um, the character of, of the surrounding district in, in large part because it will be obscured by the new um, the new gable side gable roof massing the, the much higher roof mm -hmm. which the roof is being raised by how much uh, I believe it's an additional six feet I, the, I mean the applicants here and, and and he can answer that specific question um, so you know here we have six feet eleven is it the app the applicant can can provide those figures. I don't have them at my my fingertips. I've got a question, Commissioner Pelletier. How is the the grade in the back being um, managed? Because the I'm looking at the yeah. It, all it's showing is a big step up from the first floor, a vertical drop from the second floor to the first floor in the in the landscape. Is that a retaining wall? Is like, how, how is that? If you go to the, the rendering, the 3D. That was in the front, sorry. Okay. So it's in the rendering, it's, it's really green not shown. Stuff, right. right, so, so is that gonna end up being some kind of retaining wall with a railing on the top of it? Like what's the structure of the second floor? So I mean, the, the existing site plan does show a retaining wall in that location. Some, some of the landscape features are difficult to discern because the site is so overgrown. Um, but if you look at the, the site plan here, where that drop off occurs is where this set of stairs are. Oh, there is a retaining wall there. And then, and then it it's identifies a retaining wall there. Okay, and not on the other side, though, Correct. currently. But uh, if, if you weren't able to make a drive-by, you could... I did. I just walk, didn't see anything. You, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 even, and even on foot, you could walk up to that, and you wouldn't know it until you hacked through it with a machete. Right now. Yes. But, like, in the future, I'm just curious what you're going to see from the street. But if you're saying there's already a retaining yeah. wall there, then that's fine. Thanks. <coughs> Any other questions for staff? If not, I would welcome the owner. I um, believe it's Mr. Uh, Norman Green to come forward. No, nope, wrong case. This is what? Mis Mr. Barman. Where am I here? Oh. Um, I don't know. I have. I apologize. I have a Norman Green and. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Um, the the identified name of the owner on the agenda is is incorrect. The applicant is Amit Barman. Okay. And he is here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mr. Barman, I am so sorry. Let me start by apologizing. Uh, and if you could come forward and uh, turn on one of the microphones, push the button till it turns green, and give your name for the record. That would be wonderful. And let me write this down, Mr. Armin. Amit. Got it. Thank Hello. you so much. Yes. And you'll have five minutes. You'll, I'm sorry, you'll have seven minutes. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Amit Barman. I'm the uh, owner, architect, and also the builder of this project. So uh, this is my my baby. It's now, you know, like I'm not. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, one thing to clarify your uh, site, uh, that retaining wall issue. So. We have been uh, designing this project for a while. We had the uh, meeting with the uh, tree conservation people, and then one thing that came up that there are a bunch of trees with the roots over there, and that retaining wall is that um, that's where, um, like the, the existing house and between the retaining wall, there is that 10 feet gap, which is like right now kind of patio for the existing house. So what we, uh, if we can go to the side, View, please, the side uh, elevation. So, um, so uh, the discussion with him was that um, there are trees with the roots in there, so we are not supposed to like go underground or have least uh, disturbance underground. So what we came up with that uh, we are trying to use the ground as is. So that's where uh, it's a good and bad thing coming up for us, that because the ground, we cannot touch the ground, all we can go is that 10 feet or eight, 10 feet behind the 
house because that's where the retaining wall and I have the level ground. So first floor can go 10 feet. After that, we have to no other choice but to go in the second level, which if you see in our floor plan is that the second level opens up to the grid because that's where the grid takes it to. So, um, so there are two challenges we had. One is that we cannot go beyond in the first floor. And the second floor, if we maintain the existing roof, it's only six feet six inch. So we cannot have any significant uh, addition in there or legal addition in there. And the house is only one bedroom at present. So to make it livable for uh, you know, a normal family, uh, we had to add some more rooms in here. And that's where we came up with this solution. And, and you know, as you see, the house is, was vacant for the last few years just because no one could see themselves in there because one bedroom doesn't cut for any family. So we are trying to make it better for everyone and make it a habitable, bring life to this house again. And then again, we worked with Dan for a couple of rendition, going back and forth. And then uh, we thought we came up with a solution that will be uh, nice for the neighborhood, maintaining the look of the neighborhood. And it will become a nicer looking building than what it is now. It's uh, uh, so, uh, but then again, the main, uh, all the thing about the roof, the main reason was like, we didn't, cannot touch the ground, cannot accept, excavate to go to the back, and we cannot maintain the existing roof profile because of the height, so. Thank you. Anything else? Are you willing um, to accept questions? Would you like to add anything? Um, no, I mean, uh, one thing I would definitely like to add is that, uh, uh, we worked with Dan uh, going back for in a lot of details of the house, and then we are trying to maintain the historic uh, look of the house as much as possible. And we really like, you know, because like I said, this is my design and my building, so I'm trying to give life to this baby. So I will go beyond required to make it nicer. That's why, like, I mean, the front landscape and stuff, everything will make it much nicer than what it is now. So it will be a better looking building. So Thank you very much. Yeah, now thank you. I will welcome questions. First, Commissioner Barnes. Um, Mr. Barman, oh, please, if you'll stay. Uh, two yes, quick questions yeah. for you. How much will the roof actually be raised? I was rather confused when I looked at the drawings. Was it seven feet? Was it eight feet? So the from right now, six feet, six inch, we are making it a nine feet ceiling. So yeah, so like a, a total will be all together from the existing the new, it will be like four feet exit. Oh. Four feet. Four feet. That's yeah. very different than, than the, um, I'll find it here. The second question I had for you is the staff has proposed a series of uh, a, a condition about the windows. Right. Are you aware of that, and are you um, happy with that or accepting of that? Yeah, I'm accepting of that, yes. Okay, thank you. I want to come back to this very nice uh, uh, drawing that had me so confused <laughs> that it, it's not that one. The rendering? Um, it showed six feet eleven, and then it shows the roof line, and then it it it's uh, number twenty three, and and perhaps it's just my inability to read it, but it shows uh, the existing roof as being a little bit below nineteen feet, and the top of the new roof as being twenty six feet. This is. Uh, Number 23, pa page 23, I believe, sheet A21. So I was just trying to understand. That seems to be rather more than four feet. So it's, it's this drawing, and I believe, so Commissioner Barnes sees that that's labeled six feet 11. And then the top of the roof is oh, identified okay. at 20, 20, 26. So we're going from a 19 foot height to 20. So that's that's an increase of seven feet on on that drawing. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, sorry, I, I take it back. It would be a seven, uh, seven feet. I'm sorry. Uh, seven feet tall. Seven feet tall. I'm sorry. 
Thank you. Any other questions? For I, I have a question. Commissioner Pelletier. Um, I, if you can't touch the ground with your second story addition, what's the foundation of that? So we are doing uh, like a, a, a um, isolated foundation, so pier footing and the addition of the 10 foot will be on that deck, it's like a crawl space kind. So you have a retaining wall. We're going to rebuild the retaining wall. Right. And then it will be laser beam, and it will be just like a build like a deck with a crawl space. So it will not touch the other part of the ground. So it's it a slab on grade, the second story? Uh, we'll be uh, putting a deck, just like with the retaining wall. So the retaining wall becomes the back side of the wall, and from here, our uh, the front side, the existing building is like their uh, floor is like one feet higher. So from there, we run the pressure treated wood and hang on to the retaining wall and build the floor on top. So we'll deal it like a, a crawl space. But, what's, but what is supporting the very back of the addition? That's the retaining wall. We're going to rebuild that one. The retaining wall is at the beginning of the addition. There's a whole 10 feet or so that goes back from there that where you're sitting up on the upper level. Oh, uh, uh, so the top one, top one will be have a foundation. So you're going to do a, a footing and a, and a masonry wall? You're going to do piers? Like With how is pier. that? With the pier. The top, the second floor will have a three piers, and that will have the crawl space floating on top of that. So we have the retaining wall. We had a section. We can, is it possible to share that? Yeah. Um, <coughs> is it in the report? Commissioner Pelletier, th that's in page 25. It's oh, the second to last page in the application. I did not ah, put those up on, on here, but I can get them uh, if you'd like in a, momentarily. No, I got it. I got it on my. OK, so, the, so there's a crawl space with a, with a slab. And then it's a footing all the way around, or it's piers? Pier. So is it going to? Uh, so you'll be uh, treating it like a, uh, like a uh, you know, cantilevered ceiling. So we'll have uh, insulation underneath. Uh -huh. And then, uh, you know. Uh, How is it keeping out the dirt, or is it not? I just am not fully understanding how this so works. So if you. Uh, no, uh, cannot show it here. So when the section is like, the second floor will be like somewhat, like when you have a 10 feet ceiling here, that ground would be like around like at a six feet. Something give or take. I don't have the exact grading information, but the second floor would be at a few feet higher than the ground. Right, so I got we'll that. Be, I'm looking at yeah. the section. Right. It's, I just want to know mm -hmm. what is surrounding the crawl space. Is it a strip footing with a masonry wall that you're bearing on? Do you have two piers with a beam going across? We have piers with a beam going, and we'll have a uh, insulation from the bottom with okay. a soffit. Okay. So the okay. So I I don't think the section as you've drawn it is quite right. But that's fine. That's that was my question. So you're not digging a full trench across the no. back, you're just going to have piers in the corner. Right. So that came as a recommendation from the tree conservation okay. that it cannot touch the ground too much. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank I you. I believe Commissioner Nasser had a Yes, question. this is Commissioner Nasser. I have a question about the room that is labeled as office on first floor. Mm -hmm. Why it's not considered as a bedroom? Well, that is the, right now, uh, that house has two rooms. One, this office, and it doesn't have any closet or anything. And the second one is the bedroom with the closet and things. But the so. dimensions of the room, that is, that's it to be a, considered as a bedroom. Or on the deed, it says just one bedroom. I'm just curious okay. how, how come that room with uh, all the windows and the sizes are kind of very close. To, I mean, it's, it's efficient for a bedroom. Why it's not considered a bedroom? Well, uh, the thing is like, uh, to, to my understanding, to consider something as a bedroom, you need to have a closet in there. Oh. <laughs> uh, yes, so uh, this one, existing one, doesn't have a closet, and it does serve as an office right now, whereas the bedroom was the bedroom. So I, we just kept the office as is. You know. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. thank Commissioner you. Haynes. 
thank you. Um, <coughs> I, I will say overall, I, I think the direction that you're going is, is uh, uh, a, a good one. I think the concept of adding a second floor and the way you've done it um, does maintain the, the character of, of crafts, craftsman uh, homes and, and uh, would be consistent with the streetscape. Um, my question is more the proportion of the uh, second floor addition. And I'm noticing that you are doing a nine foot ceiling and then it looks like you've got another foot to your roof spring point. And I'm wondering if that could be brought down to get a better proportion. Uh, I'm not opposed to, to the, uh, the new roof pitch, the cross gable, the steeper uh, roof pitch. But I would look to, to see what the minimum height you could do. Because um, I think it looks very top heavy relative to the width of the house the new roof and dormer in the front uh, looks very heavy for the, the bottom portion of the, of the structure. So I think um, that would be really one way to, to your, your spring point, roof spring point could be brought down um, maybe a foot, foot and a half. And I think you'd get better proportions uh, to the massing of the house. Um, I also think the rear elevation, I know it's the real elevation, but um, should take on the same architectural detailing as, as the front um, um, to, to maintain the character of the craftsman style. And, and right now it looks like a suburban vinyl 1980s facade. Uh, I don't think the sliding doors are appropriate for this house. There really ought to be swinging French doors, um, in my opinion. Uh, although, um, and I think you ought to, you know, maintain the the detailing, the brackets that are on the front and side ought to carry around to the back. Um, um, and I and I, you know, maybe consider a, a small window in the closet, just to balance that rear facade, or or maybe a a window up at the attic level, um, uh, again, to, to avoid what is a very sort of bland uh, rear facade. But otherwise, I think you're headed in the right direction and with some finessing, I think um, the, the facade would be proportionally better and consistent with the uh, streetscape and, and other craftsman style in the neighborhood. Thank you. Any other? If there aren't, are no more questions, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony and answering our questions. And um, I think we are ready to start our deliberations on this project. I would like to start uh, this on this project. Normally, I would not be thrilled with a um, second story addition like this, but I think there are two things. First of all, this house um, really is not usable as it currently is. I think it needs something. And I think uh, the second story addition is reasonable. And I think most of the most of the design is reasonable. I actually like Commissioner Haynes's idea of perhaps lowering the um, the this roof by uh, as much as possible. Sure. And you could work with staff on that. Um, but I think it, it's something that we should approve because I would love to see this house back in service. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? Um, my concerns with this uh, proposal or this hop was the fact that it, it so radically changed the appearance of the house. What was a one low rise, one story bungalow all of a sudden becomes a two story um, craftsman house and it, it loses everything about it that it was prior. and. And we see a lot of large additions on historic properties, a lot. And we've seen additions put on historic properties, but generally they do try to, the addition is in keeping with the original appearance of the house. 
I feel like this is making a new house um, completely. It, it may look like the rest on the block, but it doesn't look like what it used to look like. And I, and I do understand you need, the, you need an occupiable second floor because the house is very small. But I agree with Commissioner Haynes, you need to bring your spring line or your, your spring line down, your ceilings down. Um, your spring line could actually be around seven feet within a rim around the room and your ceiling at eight and have a little you know rise to it within the room and then keep it at eight. And that's gonna bring that, that entire roof line down a lot, which I think you need to do. And if you can, to whatever degree, flatten it out a bit, um, if that's possible. Um, it's a difficult site, um, and I appreciate everything else you're doing with the house, pulling, you know, uncovering it from the vinyl or aluminum siding, whatever it was, putting in new windows, freshening it up. It's going to look a heck of a lot better than your other neighbor next door with that <laughs> awful <laughs> addition that was allowed at some point. No, no, no. Um, but. Um, I also agree with Commissioner Haynes about the back elevation looks really, ah, nothing. It's just, Good it looks like a thing. shed. Um, and then the other thing is um, um, you don't show any closets in your new bedrooms, so you better get them in there. So Actually, I do have, well, I didn't show the uh, not uh, in the folding rugged. doors. No, you, you show them in the master closet, but the other ones, you don't have closets in them, so you need yeah. to yeah, yeah. get them in the, there. The bedroom one, the one, the wall you see there, that's the closet. I just didn't uh, forget to tell, put yeah. the door in there. But yeah, well, bedroom two needs one. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, I would welcome a... I'd like oh, to oh, make a motion. Okay. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. I, yes. I would like to, I would welcome a motion. <laughs> um, I would like to make a motion that we approve this hop with two conditions. The condition outlined by staff in the report and the condition suggested by a member of this commission this evening that the roof line be brought down by a foot. Is there a second? This Commissioner Haynes, I'll second. So we're so let's let's do this properly here. You're so you are making a motion that we approve um, <laughs> hop number uh, one zero zero one two two nine at sixty seven twelve Westmoreland Avenue. Yes. Correct. Thank you for that friendly amendment. It's not an amendment. <laughs> All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. And, I, and you um, can work with staff um, with, the, with the suggestions we made. And um, if there's something significant, like if you decide you want to do uh, more with the rear, uh, it can be brought to us as an amendment. Uh, it's very simple. Um, but. But thank you very much, and, and uh, we really look forward to seeing this completed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> the next project is a hearing that's been held over um, for uh, deferred from uh, August 17th at uh, 1 High Street in Brookville. Is there a staff report? Uh, yes. I'm, I'm not sure exactly. <clears throat> I don't recall having done this as a, as the chair. So, do we do a staff report, or do I'll we... do a very brief? Uh, okay, thank you. Summary, yeah. Because there were some questions that have been answered, and I'm not sure exactly the sequence that we handle this in. So, That's you right. do your staff report. We'll, then we'll call on. We'll, we will call on the, the uh, owner's representative. Okay. So this is a primary resource in the Brookville Historic District, and. <clears throat> The proposal was for an addition, hardscape alterations, and fencing. As you note it, this hearing was continued from the August 17th meeting, and the HPC requested town setback requirements and property line information, and the applicant has provided the following. So this was provided in the staff report. 
these are the standards of the town. The property survey and just a close up of the contentious east property line. As well as a revised site plan, specifically calling out the 12 foot inch retaining wall. So the neighbor at 212 Market Street did not provide a survey before the meeting, but the town did provide additional information in the form of comments and exhibits. And those have been provided to you. So staff continues to recommend that the commission approve with four conditions the hop. And those conditions are as follows. We've seen these previously. And I will note that uh, the appl applicant clarified last time that the PVC is actually PVC composite. And both the HPC and the town indicated that they were generally okay with that. Staff did not revise the conditions because this is continuation of the previous hearing, but you may consider removing that condition in your uh, findings tonight. So again, recommending that we approve the application with conditions, and that's consistent with 24A8, B1, 2, and D, and standards number two, nine, and 10. And that summarizes uh, the report. I can take any questions you have for me. Any questions for staff? If not, <laughs> I hope I have the right name this time. Um, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Lees, uh, you believe you are the, uh, you are representing the owner, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. And you will have um, seven minutes uh, for to testify. Again, I'm the, representing Mr. Saj Niazi, the owner, and I am the architect working with Mr. Niazi to try to come up with an addition that satisfies his requirements for office structure. Um, we have could you taken state your, I'm sorry, could you state your name for the record, please? Jeffrey Lees. Thank you. <clears throat> we have taken the recommendation of the commission and implemented them into our design. Uh, I just really wanted to address the uh, conditions primarily as my purpose here. Um, again, I understand the, the first condition having to do with brick versus um, uh, part CMU. I had the previous meeting stated that I think we could come up with a good compromise where there is a, about a seven and a half foot section of transition between the primary resource and the addition that on the uh, above the floor is basically a glass infill. And I would recommend that below that it could be CMU. And then the addition starts as brick foundation at, uh, around the rest of the structure. So that was, that was the first concern I had. The second was using PVC trim. Again, we have a design with detail for a skirt board around the lower part of the foundation. And we don't think that the um, composite material in that situation is good. I know from experience that it wicks water. It will be subject to deterioration rapidly as a result of that. So again, the vinyl PVC trim um, will be much more resistant to water um, penetrating the, the trim and delaminating as it would with a, a fiber cement. Um, we have taken into consideration the request for the vinyl fencing um, to be wood. So if that uh, is the only way that the commission will uh, accept it, it, I think it's unfortunate that the Wood fencing will probably have to be pressure treated, which from a visual aesthetic standpoint, I think is it's not historic, certainly, and I don't think it's visually uh, beneficial, and I think it will become a, a maintenance problem over time. Um, and otherwise, the, the step back of the fence from the property line, uh, condition number four, I don't have any problem with that. So I just wanted to primarily address those first three conditions. Any questions for Mr. Lees? Commissioner I, Barnes. Actually, this, and I'm sorry, but I just want to be sure that I correctly understood the staff in directing the condition number two, because there was discussion about a composite as opposed to the fiber cement, if I understood correctly. Could you just clarify so I am 
are we talking about the same thing? <laughs> I believe so. So at the last meeting, the question of this condition and the PVC trim and freeze board came up. And I believe at that time, the applicant's architect uh, specified that that would be a PVC composite, not a, a plasticky PVC trim. And the commission seemed that they were generally okay with that. And the applicant can confirm again that that's what they're proposing, but that's my understanding. Yes, it, it, Mr. Lee, it, are you proposing a composite PVC trim? PVC is a is separate from the composite. The composite is made up of different fibers. PVC is a, a different product altogether. And uh, if I, I inadvertently said composite, I didn't mean that. Um, I, I strictly meant PVC versus fiber cement. Okay. Fiber cement is what we have for our siding. Okay. So, so everyone has now agreed that what would be used would be fiber cement? No. No. Okay. Only for siding. But the trim, skirt boards, and so forth, uh, freeze boards would be PVC which when painted is virtually indistinguishable from wood. And when the staff was talking about the modification of this condition? Uh, I am not sure exactly what this material is. Uh, we're hearing PVC now. My understanding that is that we were talking about PVC composite. Generally a PVC composite is millable and paintable whereas a, a strictly PVC trim is more plastic and, and the finish does not allow it to be painted. And you had mentioned that the town was also in agreement with PVC composite, if That's I my heard understanding. what yes. you said. Correct. And yes. what Mr. Lees, I think, just said is that that's something that le uh, has problems with water. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. I just was trying to understand whether this condition was being addressed, eliminated, or was confused, or I was confused. But just to clarify one more point, because the HPC and the town were both generally okay with PVC composite, this condition could be amended. It could be the proposed PVC trim and freeze board will be either fiber cement or PVC composite. That is an option. Uh, this is... Commissioner Pelletier, do you have a brand name for this PVC composite? Because I've never heard of such a thing. Yeah, AZEC. AZEC is PVC. So, so I, I think a, there's some, some <clears throat> terminology here that maybe isn't accurate. I mean, there's fiber cement trim, and then there's PVC trim. And, and I agree with Mr. Lees that that fiber cement trim and skirt boards and everything is not going to hold up as well as PVC. So, so anyway, my, I, I would be averse to condition number two. That's my point. <laughs> this is Commissioner Haynes. Commissioner can, Haynes. Can, can I uh, also ask, have you ever used uh, Boral trim. I'm sorry. Uh, a product called boral board. It's it is a composite. It's a from, fly ash, right? Type product. And what, what do you think about that? That's a possibility. Um, boral doesn't make it anymore. There's a, another manufacturer that bought boral, but uh, they still make the uh, fly ash product, basically that. Uh, they have different profiles for the, for the siding. Um, I've not used the trim personally, so I'm not totally familiar with its uh, application in place. I am with the PVC, so uh, it's something we could explore, but I don't recommend it. Commissioner Radu, did you have a question? Your your, uh, <laughs> no. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Doman. There it goes. I'm, I'm still confused on this item number two. 
I assume this PVC trim is AZAC. Is that what you had in mind? That's the brand name, yes. Yeah. Exactly. That's what you, yeah, and, and from my experience, that's perfectly fine for trim and freeze board and everything else. So if you want to call it PVC trim, we are thinking in our heads, this is AZAC. Is that correct? That's correct. That's so, exactly correct. It's just kind of a generic, I say PVC generic, I, you say AZAC. I, I understand. Um, so item number two then is not applicable. It says the freeze board will be fiber cement. We, we're not going to have that. We're going to allow you to use PVC. Is that correct? I'm hoping. Yes. Okay. I, I mean, that's what I thought that's the staff said. Well, that, that is, about. right now, that is a condition that has been recommended by staff, and we have the, we have the ability to change the staff recommendations, okay. should we so choose. Any other questions? Commissioner Burdett. Um, my question is about something that was brought up in the Brookville comments. Um, about the buffer area between the, to the neighbor immediately adjacent where the new fence is going right up against the property line and it's going to take out the green buffer that is existing between the two properties? If you want to call it a green buffer, basically it's an overgrown weeded area. Well, you're showing a green area between, in your drawings you're showing a green area between the two properties so the rendering was focused on the addition so you're saying your plan is to take down all the trees and all the green space put up a fence the length of the basically your property well there's some dead trees and then there's basically um, infill uh, what I'll call uh, uh, volunteer trees that uh, aren't original so it's, it's an overgrown, poorly maintained area right now that looks green in the summertime. So, okay, but when this is all done according to your plans, the neighbor will have a wood fence along his property, along the property line, and, and that's gonna be it. At that point that we have it along most of that property line, not entirely, from the curb all the way back to the, I'm assuming to the back of the parking at the far end? We actually submitted a updated site plan to the town showing that fence reduced back to about the edge of the steps that okay. show on the site plan. Okay. Um, and basically, uh, we we're trying to negotiate that space with the adjacent property owner, buffer space. Buffer space. What is the negotiation? We, because we've moved the fence back, we're not affecting the neighbor's driveway. Now, if the town insists on buffer space, we need to find out, we need to come to some kind of agreement with the local town and the owner of the adjacent property as to how much buffer space we could provide. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I've been, I'm sorry, I have one other question. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, yes, Commissioner Pelletier. Commissioner Pelletier. Um, as far as the wood fence goes, uh, can't you use cedar or something besides pressure treated? I'm sorry? Can you use cedar besides pressure treated wood? Like you said, the only option in wood is pressure treated and there are other woods that are weather resistant. Well, you're right. You could use cedar. It has to be maintained steadily. It has to be stained or painted it repeatedly. It doesn't really. I mean, I have a cedar fence and I've had it for 10 years and it looks great and I've done nothing to it. Uh huh. So. And it's still intact. It's still vertical. It hasn't sagged or oh, no, it's, uh, it's, split or it, went, it turned gray. Hmm. But other than that, it's in pretty good shape. I've seen cedar I just, fences deteriorate over time. So. Yeah, it's just, I suspect right, we're right, have just to suggestion other than pressure treated. That's all. We could consider that. Okay, thanks. Okay. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony and answering questions. And now we can start deliberations. Would anyone like to kick off the deliberations?
Oh, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. Yes. Um, the time's getting away from me here. Chris, <laughs> Chris um, Scanlon from the town. I am so sorry. <laughs> and you'll have five minutes. If you could step back, please, Mr. Lees. Thank you. Just for clarification, is it seven minutes is what Mr. Kine told me I had as, as the town representative, not five? Five. Five for the town representative. Right? Is that correct? Interested groups, LAP, that gets five minutes. But if you are representing the town of Brookville, then it is indeed seven minutes. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, no, I'm sorry. I was, I was confused about which one you were, <laughs> you were representing. So, sorry. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with the commission tonight. Um, my name is Chris Scanlon. I'm chairperson of the Brookville Planning Commission and, and also representing the Brookville LAP. Is your microphone? Sorry, I turned it off. Um, I'll repeat. My, my name is Chris Scanlon. I'm chairperson of the Brookville Planning Commission and also representing the Brookville LAP tonight. Um, we'd like to respond to some of the questions that came up and provide some clarifications from the previous August 17th HPAC hearing, as well as provide our LAP comments uh, to the applicant's revised plans. Um, first on the question of the trim, uh, the town does not take exception to uh, PVC trim, AKA AZAC um, or Boral. Those are all acceptable products that have been used successfully in the town in the past, so we have no exception to that. Um, we agree with staff's recommendations that the fencing material should be wood in lieu of pr proposed vinyl. There are no vinyl fences in the town of Brookville currently. Um, we agree with the staff's recommendation that a fence along the east property line should not extend any further towards Market Street than it is in its current configuration. Um, okay, so you have Exhibit A up there. Um, we did have an additional comment on the fence along the south lot line. Um, because of its prominence from the public view and the fact that it really, in our mind, is considered a front or side yard condition, the town requests that this fence be no more than 40 inches, 42 inches tall and be a split rail or picket design. This is consistent with other fences approved in the front or side yards in the town in the past. Um, if you've been to the town of Brookville, we have very few stockade fences. It, the ones that are there are all in the rear yards, um, and so the town really benefits from an open view space and borrowed views from the, the neighbors. Um, and we had uh, multiple people at our, our previous uh, town commissioner he hearing ask that the, the fence height be reduced. Uh, we're okay with the taller six-foot fence along the east property line just from a buffering condition and that it is being held back in... Um, uh, the town also wishes to, cor cor to submit a correction to the staff's exhibit that was presented at the last hearing that um, didn't accurately represent the proposed location along the east property line. Um, so the, the staff had represented it along the east line in the blue color. The actual proposal is the yellow color. Um, so normally that would not be a major consideration, but it, it is in this case because the fact that it eliminates the green space between the two properties that we'll talk about in a second. Um, also noted that the, the buffer area between One High Street and 212 Market Street on the east side of the drawing, um, the rendering is not consistent with what the drawing submitted. So if you go to the Exhibit B, uh, you will see the rendering on the left-hand side there shows a green space that buffers between the addition and the residence driveway. Um, the drawing on the right-hand side, I added the vehicle in for comparison just to show where the neighboring property uh, driveway is. And so it's not only a six-foot fence, it's a six-foot fence on what looks to be scaled to be about a 48-inch wall. So it ends up being somewhere between a nine and a half and a 10 and a half foot solid surface that is directly on the property line or along the, the driveway. Um, the applicant plan, applicant's plans also require the removal of four large trees and 10 inch to 28 inch diameter along the east property line that are not noted in the hop. Those should be included um, as they are required that they're greater than 10 inches. Um, the town does not take exception to the removal of those trees because they are in bad shape, but um, we will request that any trees or vegetation that's removed be replaced with some other landscaping to the town's approval to create that same buffer zone that we have now. 
Uh, at the August 17th hearing, the applicant stated that there were no setback requirements in the town's historic village commercial zone. There are, in fact, three clauses in the town's ordinance relating specifically to setbacks and buffering requirements. I won't read them all to you, but the, the primary one is all setbacks must be compatible with, must demonstrate a compatible relationship to the existing, to the adjacent existing and proposed development. Um, also talks later on about significant or uh, maintaining screening and buffering to adjacent properties. On September 6th, the applicant came to the town of Brookville um, to have a preliminary zoning review. Um, at, that at that meeting, the applicant was advised by the Brookville Planning Commission that the current proposed plans do not meet the above requirements related to setbacks and buffering due to the significant removal of existing green space buffer and the proposed retaining wall fence configuration along the east property line. The town requests that the current green space and buffer be maintained in its current configuration at a minimum. So in essence, the fence location stays at the same location that it is today. Any proposed tree or landscaping removal should be replaced with new landscaping for review and approval by the town to maintain the visual buffer between the properties. Um, and then our last um, concern about the property still remains with the number of offices being proposed and the number of visitors that will be coming in and out of the property and the, re the zoning requirement that um, sufficient off-site parking needs to be demonstrated uh, before we would approve that from a zoning perspective. Um, so that would be dealt with with the town through the Brookville uh, building permit the review process. That's it for, for the town. Are um, you ready to accept questions? Absolutely. Mr. Scanlon, okay, any questions for Mr. Scanlon? Commissioner Doman. I guess I'll start. Um, I realize this, is, this whole kind of border on the east side of the property is kind of contentious. Um, and at the previous meeting, there was a discussion about where the real property line was, and the, and the neighbor then said there was another survey that would show it not as the applicant shows it, that it was a different line. Apparently, which is what we're looking at now, that, this, that the survey that the applicant has presented is correct as far as the property line. Is that, as far as you know, is that correct? Uh, the, the town really doesn't have any say. It looks to be from a licensed surveyor. I, we, we don't really take a stance on that. Okay. Our, our position is at this point, the actual property lines really aren't coming into relevance because of the fact that the buffer is a greater distance than the conten contention in the property lines. Do you see any way that, I guess this is, difficult, but is there any way a buffer could be maintained or could the applicant work with a property owner to relocate a driveway and maybe put some more space on the side? Is there anything, any, any consideration, any discussion along those lines um, that you know of? Uh, we left the last Brookville Planning Commission meeting with giving advice to the applicant and the applicant said that they would return with um, changes potentially to the proposal that address our concerns. Um, we have not received anything to date from the applicant. But with, the, um, with the fence being moved back on the east property line, um, that I'm trying to look at, uh, I lost the drawing, the one that you had that showed the car and then the, the concrete wall, and yeah, this drawing here, doesn't, doesn't that kind of go uphill a little bit? And wouldn't that, I mean, it shows it being 10 feet, five inches, but in reality, the fence is farther back. You're not really seeing this 10 foot five because the fence is, doesn't come as close to the road as what it had previously been drawn to come. Uh, that would be true from the, the street along the sidewalk, but that would not be true to the adjacent property owner. There's a significant portion of their driveway that would have this 10 foot five solid wall basically along their property line, along the driveway line. Okay. Whereas right now it's basically a two foot or maybe 18 inch brick wall 
and then just a, a very small brick retaining wall, and then the grade basically raises up naturally with green space between the properties. Okay. We're, we're basically it, asking that that condition be maintained. I understand. Um, I, I, I'll think about some more. Okay, thank you for now. Okay. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, now we can start deliberations. Would anyone like to kick off deliberations on this? Well, we can move to <laughs> we can move to a motion if you'd like. Uh, well, I, I, oh no, Commissioner Barnes. Commissioner Barnes. You know, one of the things that is is um, troubling to me a little bit is that we generally deal with clearly defined property lines, and so you know that you can build to within five feet of the property line or you have to have an eight-foot setback. But what I think I'm experiencing is um, we have the applicant who says this is the property line. We have the neighbor who says, but has, as far as I know, not produced anything to counter that. No, no, that is not the property line. And we have the town saying we'd like to maintain a bit of buffer between the two properties, which I think makes our decisions somewhat complicated. I think, I think one thing that we can think about is that the city, the town will uh, probably dictate what, will, <laughs> what the um, area between the two properties will, will be. I don't know that that our deliberation will take care of that. Mm -hmm. That's my view. I don't know. Is there any any other? This is commission. This is Commissioner Bird. Based on what this, the town has provided, that that there are three clauses that relate specifically to setbacks and buffering requirements, which means that they will determine. Right. The property line appears to be fixed. Mm -hmm. So based on what the town has provided in their documentation, the, the neighbor did not provide anything. So if, if the town is going to deal with the property line, the setback, and the buffer, and they've made a recommendation for a fence height, then can we make a motion to approve this based on the staff's recommendations and on the, the town's yes. recommendations as outlined in their, I mean, how do we address this? I think we, I think we can just say that the town will determine what the, what the my understanding is that the, the property was determined by a licensed surveyor, surveyor. Mm -hmm. and that to me is <laughs> fine. But the town, will, I think, will determine what the, what the area between the two properties will be based on their, based on their I guess, ordinance? Is that, would that be part of the ordinance? Yeah. So I don't think that's <laughs> even up to us, to be honest. <laughs> Vice, Vice Chair Burdett, um, Rebecca Ballow, for the record, the, the commission, if I may offer, um, the commission may, there, you guys have a lot of options. One option would be potentially to defer until the town has ruled right. on this matter, and then the applicant has to come back with a revised hop, or you can, another option would be to condition the approval of this hop that it must conform to the final plans as approved by the town of Brookville and ultimate conformance is delegated to the staff. That could be for, for many items, though. Um, so that's, that's, that's a little wide open, but those are some options. I, I guess uh, my concern is that the list of items from the town of Brookville's planning, or their comments, there's nine of them. And I'm a little leery of saying, Everything on here, we're going to defer without, excuse me, there's a, 
again, these these types of coordination um, timeline sort of issues between the towns and the HPC, this is fairly common. You know, mm -hmm. we see this in the town of Kensington or for example, in, in the city of Tacoma Park or often with Chevy Chase Village. Often we take care of this back and forth kind of behind um, the scenes right. before it comes yeah. Yeah. it comes to the commission. Um, but this does happen from time to time. So, th so if you did want to defer to allow the town to take care of these matters and then have the hop come back, that is in line with decisions that you have made in the past. Yes, Commissioner Doman. Commissioner Doman, I. Is your I, microphone on? Okay. Um, the uh, the letter from Christopher Scallon, representing the town of Brookville, on item number eight, to me, it's clear. It says the current proposals. The current proposed plans do not meet the above requirements related to setbacks and buffering due to removal of the existing green space buffer and the proposed retaining wall construction along the property line. They, <laughs> they're not gonna accept it. Um, we can't, if we refer back to the Brookville, we know that the situation is unacceptable to them, it says so right here. That's, that's their position on this thing. So um, I don't know where it takes us, but um, the, the property line is still an issue and they still would like to see a green space in there. And I think maybe the, the applicant will have to come up with um, some other agreeable solution to create two feet of green or something in that in that area. That's what I'd, I, I, I think, think you're, we, I think you're in, in, in pass here. I th no, I don't think we are. I think if we if we make a condition that the that the uh, area that is that is under the jurisdiction of the town of Brookville meets zoning requirements and ordinances of, of Brookville, we're covered. I think. Is that, would that be? I'm, I'm going to ask staff because they deal with zoning issues a lot more than we do as a commission. So I would, I would like to have a, whether that would be appropriate or not. Yes, I think so. Just uh, my recommendation would be to approve it with a condition that the applicant work with the town to work out any issues regarding setback. Right. The way the letter is written, uh, it seems that the buffer issue is the remaining setback issue. Right. So once that's worked out, the applicant can submit any required revisions to us. And as long as you give me final review authority, I can just stamp them. Any other, any other comments? Yeah. Um, any, any, uh, yes. Commissioner, Commissioner Pelletier. Pelletier. So are we going to vote on the conditions from staff? Because we currently have four conditions. We first have to have a motion. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to vote on. I, I think well, the can motion. Can we discuss these first, the conditions from staff, and if we agree before somebody makes a motion, can we can we agree or disagree on the conditions from staff? No, uh, that has to be part of the motion. We can't discuss it. We can discuss it, but uh, what we vote on is what we determine, um, or what what the motion is. And if we decide we want to include all of the conditions by staff, fine. If we want to make any amendment to the conditions, fine. We have that authority to do that, right? Right. Is that correct? Yes. So we do that, we'll do that as part of, our, part of the motion. But before that, we can discuss what we think should be included as conditions in this project. Right. That's what I want to talk yes, about. Yes, we can decide that. But then it will be part of the motion. Right. Is that, am I clear? Yes. Okay, so thank you. So I wanted to <laughs> discuss the conditions. Okay. And so I don't agree with number two um, as far as the PVC goes. I, the, the, the zoning commission and, and they, well, the town of Brookville has stated that PVC is not a problem for them. So I think as far as number two goes, I would, I would, at some point, if someone wants to make a motion, I would, I would like that stricken from the record. But anyway, but 
The other okay, one so is we have, your, we have your suggestion to strike number two from the yes. record, correct? Thank you. Yes, and number four, do we, number four has to do with the fencing along the property line. Is that something that we want to remove at this time and place it in the hands of Brookville zoning? That's my question. I think, well, I, I will give you my opinion. I think that we talk, we have certain standards that we, that we uh, feel are important for fencing. And so I think we should include our standards for, for fencing, like wood, certain heights, picket fence, so forth. So we should include, it, which, which I think is part of this one. But I think as far as where it's placed and as far as uh, landscaping or anything, that would be left to the city. Is that, does that sound reasonable mm -hmm. to everybody here? Okay. You might, you might then want to strike the east property line and just say something along the eastern boundary or side or something because since the property line still seems to somehow be in... Well, I, 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 I would propose just saying we will, the, the fencing will meet our standards, but where it's located and the, and the buffering and whatever will be left to the, the town working with the property owner. Okay, that sounds good. So we could strike the first sentence and just say any additional fencing in this location will be constructed from wood no higher than four feet, have an open picket design with final review and approval delegated to staff and Brookville zoning. Fine. That sounds, yeah. That okay. sounds good. So are we ready for a motion? <laughs> okay. Um, one minute. And we can fiddle with it. <laughs> Here it is. Okay. okay. I'm, Chair, I make a motion for um, hop number 1003919 at 1 High Street, Brookville based on the recommendations that we approve the HOP based on the recommendations of staff and with the following conditions provided by staff of one, the exposed foundation of the addition along Market Street will be simplified and the entire foundation will be either PARG, CMU, or brick with final approval, review and approval delegated to staff. The proposed vinyl fencing will be wood with final review and approval delegated to staff. That any additional fencing in this location will be constructed from wood no higher than four feet and have an open picket design with final review and approval delegated to staff. And that the conditions along uh, the property lines uh, will conform to the town of Brookville's uh, requirements as determined, and I'm fading out here. Um, determined by the by city ordinances. By city ordinances and requ by city ordinances, and upon their review and approval, um, as well. And delegated to staff. And delegated to staff. Coordinated and delegated we to staff. We got all that? <laughs> we, we have a recording of this, right? Okay. Is there a second? Can I make a friendly amendment? Uh, we, no, you can't until we have a second. Okay. Does anyone want to make a second? This is Commissioner Pelletier. I'll second. Okay. Now you can offer a friendly amendment should you choose. <laughs> okay. Um, on the um, recommendation from Brookville, they recommend that the south lot line and the fence be no more than 42 inches tall. It shows it on their diagram here, and they would like to see a split rail picket fence. So rather than leaving it, it says no higher than four feet, I'd like to see words in there that's no more than 42 tall, which is what the Brookville recommends. Okay, now, the person that made the motion, are you, would you accept that as a friendly amendment? I will accept that as a friendly amendment. The person amendment. who made the second, will you accept that as a friendly amendment? I will. Okay, so the fence will be no higher than 42 inches. Okay? Now with that, I would, I would like to have a vote. 
And all in favor say, or uh, let's see, let's do this, let's do this. I, I'm kind of nervous about it. Let's do this as a roll call, <laughs> starting with Commissioner Nasser. Yes. Commissioner Rado, yes. Commissioner Haynes, yes. Commissioner Burdett, yes. Turn on your mic. I think I'll abstain at this point. Okay. One abst abstention. Commissioner <laughs> Doman, yes. Commissioner Pelletier? Yes. Commissioner Sutton, yes. And so we have a vote of seven yes, one abstention, and the project is approved. Thank you very much. Now, next on the agenda, we have um, historic preservation tax credits, group number five. Thank you all for this, for coming before us. Is there a staff report for the? Uh, uh, yes, there is. So you. as you noted, this is group five of the 2021 tax credits. Group five includes 10 applications consisting of approximately $771,471.78. And we're asking for your approval. Thank you. Now, this is, we're going to do this as we've done in the past. When we get them all together, we approve them. We approve each one individually, and then we approve them all together and submit them, correct? And we're not quite there yet. Right. So you're approving each indivi individually, okay. and then at the end, you're approving the transfer of all groups to the Department oh, of Oh, now we're, now we're, this, at this, this point. This isn't the end. That'll be in the future. I was okay, just clarifying the process. Okay, great. Thank you. Is there a motion? This is Commissioner Burdett. I make a motion that we approve Group 5 of the um, Historic Preservation Tax Credit applications for calendar year 2025. 2025 or 2022? I'm sorry, 2021. <laughs> <laughs> is there a second? It's Commissioner Haynes. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank Aye. you. Opposed? Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, minutes. Um, from August 17th, and I didn't check to see if we have them for September 7th. Do we have both? Okay. Would anyone like to make a motion? Has anyone read the minutes and would like to make a motion? This is uh, Commissioner Doman, and I have read the minutes, the draft minutes for August 17, 2022, and I, the only thing I have to question, it lists acting chair is Commissioner Burdett and Commissioner Dolman is acting chair, and I had no idea that I was acting chair. <laughs> but other than that, I will accept it. Okay. <laughs> is. Is so I recommend that I propose that we uh, approve these minutes. Is there a second? This oh, is you're just you're just you're just um, make, a, make a motion for the seventeenth. Does anyone like to make yeah, a motion for the seventh? This is Commissioner Burdett. I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes from uh, September 7th, 2022. Okay. Is there a second to the first motion for August 7th or August 17th? This is Commissioner Haynes. I'll uh, second the August 17th. Is minutes. there a second for September 7th? Commissioner Haynes again. I will second the <laughs> September 7th. Okay. Minutes. I would. What, like a boat on both together. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Thank you very much. And now we are adjourned. Sorry, I'm just moving ahead here. So I'm going to take this back. Watch this. Um, are there any commission items? Wait, one, one moment. Are we back with the recording? Okay, thank you. Please. I'm sorry. No, any no worries. Any commission items? Any staff items? No staff items. No, we're done. Thank you. Getting a little punchy. <laughs>